Hello, and welcome to a lecture on quarter wave matching. I'm Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, I'll explain a little bit about quarter wave transmission lines. These are transmission lines which are one quarter wavelength long at the frequency of interest. I'll explain how to use these structures for impedance matching. I'll show you an example. And then we'll discuss the topic of impedance inversion, which is a feature of quarter wave transmission lines. So just to remind you, here's our nomenclature and some theoretical relationships uh, for transmission lines in general. When we have a length L transmission line and the characteristic impedance of that transmission line is Z sub C, and it's terminated into a load Z sub L, we find that the input impedance is given by this expression, where lambda is the wavelength in the transmission line, and gamma is the reflection coefficient at this point. So gamma is given by z sub l minus z sub c, z sub l plus z sub c. Quarter wave matching uses quarter wavelength sections of transmission line. So the length of the transmission line will be lambda by 4. And so using our expression and substituting lambda by 4, we find that the input impedance is given by z sub c squared divided by z sub l. So this relatively complicated looking expression becomes a very simple expression, which depends only on z sub l and z sub c. Now to match, you just use a quarter wavelength transmission line and use the characteristic impedance to achieve the matching. The characteristic impedance is obtained from this expression. You simply solve for the characteristic impedance. Solving for the characteristic impedance, you get that the required characteristic impedance for matching is the square root of z sub n, that's what you want to match to, times z sub l, that's the terminating impedance. Now note that this is only going to work for matching real valued impedances to other real valued impedances. If either Zn or Zl have a complex component, then the required characteristic impedance is going to be complex. A transmission line with a complex valued characteristic impedance is going to be one which stores energy. And that's the opposite of what you want from a transmission line. So don't forget, this technique only works, as I've shown here anyway, only works when converting real impedances to other real impedances. And if one of those impedances is complex valued, then you have to add something to this to deal with that uh, imaginary component. So here's an example. In this example, I'd like to match 23.7 ohms to 50 ohms. I'm going to do this at 2 gigahertz. And I am once again going to implement this on FR4 circuit board material. So this is going to be a microstrip structure. The length is going to be 22.6 millimeters. I've worked out in a previous lecture what lambda is in FR4. And so you can go back and look at that material if you need a refresher on that. But you will find that the length here has to be 22.6 millimeters for this transmission line structure to be a quarter wavelength long at this frequency. Z sub C is given by the square root of the desired input impedance and the terminating impedance. And I guess that should really be Z sub L, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, the square root of the product of those two things is 34.4 ohms. So that's the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Now, we know that characteristic impedance of microstrip line is set by the width of the transmission line. That's if you're using a standard thickness substrate, which is the case for FR4. So to set the characteristic impedance to 34.4 ohms, we have to figure out what W is. One way to do this is to go back and look at this chart in the book. Characteristic impedance versus width for FR4 and accounting for the manufacturing variances. And if we need an impedance 
uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 ohms, we see that the width is going to have to be somewhere between 5 and 6 millimeters. So we anticipate that we need to be somewhere in here in order to uh, achieve the characteristic impedance that we desire. The number I get is 5.3 millimeters. Now the way I got that was using the uh, paper Wheeler 1977, which I've talked about in a previous lecture. You could also get this from an application of some kind. There are numerous uh, software packages, numerous web applications that will uh, tell you what width to use for FR4 at a given frequency to achieve a certain characteristic impedance. Now, if you use those things, they are not guaranteed to be free of error. And you can always sanity check your result using the plot on the previous slide. What I did was I used Wheeler 77 and then uh, checked and made sure that was consistent with the plot on the previous slide, and it was. And remember, there's always some manufacturing variance in the relative primitivity of FR4, so you're not really doing yourself any favors by trying to make this result ultra precise. You should try to be as precise as you reasonably can be, but you should not agonize over the quality of an approximation which is used to estimate this value. In any event, here's a completed design. Very easy. 50 ohms on one side, 23.7 ohms on the other side. Quarter wavelength is 22.6 millimeters. The strip width is 5.3 millimeters. And there you have it. Now, a quarter wavelength match may or may not be more compact than a single stub tuning structure. We've talked about single stub tuning in a previous lecture. You've probably seen it in previous courses. Uh, here it's roughly the same size, at least in terms of overall extent. Now a summary of quarter wave matching. Here's the steps. First, is either terminating impedance complex valued? If it is, stop. Quarter wave matching by itself will not work. You can have a solution which involves a quarter wave match, but you're going to have to do something about the reactants. The matching section length is set equal to one quarter wavelength. So you figure out what a wavelength is in uh, the material that you're using and you uh, compute the length on that basis. The matching section characteristic impedance is the square root of the product of the terminating impedances. So you figure out which impedance you're converting from and to, multiply those together, take the square root, and that is the characteristic impedance of the transmission line that you need. The matching section width is set to achieve the necessary characteristic impedance. So uh, I've assumed microstrip line here. So once I had a characteristic impedance, I then saw, set out to find the width. Of course, you can do quarter wave matching with other kinds of transmission lines, coaxial cable. You can use uh, twin conductor cable. Uh, anything that serves as a transmission line can be used to do a quarter wave match. Now, a related topic, and that's impedance inversion. A quarter wave match is an example of an impedance inverter. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's a quarter wave section. It's lambda by four, has characteristic impedance of Z sub C, and load impedance of Z sub L. And we've shown that the input impedance of this thing is Z sub C squared divided by Z sub L. Note that the impedances here are inversely related. That is, the relationship between Z in and Z L is a reciprocal relationship. The larger ZL is, the smaller ZN is, and so forth. So for example, if Z sub L is a short circuit, then Z sub N will be an open circuit. That's uh, an extreme realization of that uh, fact. Now some applications of this idea, impedance inversion. You can use this idea to transform low impedances into high impedances. And where this comes in, in RF engineering, and radio engineering, is when you need to hide a power supply. So let me show you what goes on there. Oftentimes you have some device, here's a generic symbol for an amplifier, and it has to be powered from a DC power supply. And the only way you can get the power supply into the device is through the output. It turns out that power supplies tend to have relatively low impedance inputs. So 
This power supply will load the output of that amplifier if you just directly connect it. However, if you directly connect it through a quarter wave section, then what happens is that quarter wave section transforms the low impedance of the power supply into a high impedance. And as long as the impedance looking this way is less, then the power supply will be effectively hidden. So this is one technique for hiding power supplies, even when they have to be directly connected to RF signal lines. Shows up all the time, especially in amplifiers at UHF and above. Another application is to replace inductors, which are particularly nasty at SHF and above, with capacitors. So one thing you can do is you can have, uh, if you need an inductance, what you can do instead is take that inductor and run it through a quarter wave line. And now this thing looks like a capacitor. A third application is you can combine quarter wave matches with stub matching and other quarter wave sections to make filters. Filters are devices which modify frequency response, not necessarily transforming the impedance. That will be the topic of a future lecture in a future chapter. By the way, this circuit here is also an impedance inverter. I'm showing you this just to connect this all back to uh, discrete reactance concepts. If I have a load Z sub L out here and I connect it through this particular topology with inductors uh, on top and a capacitor in the center, and all these reactances are the same, in other words, the only thing that's different is a sign, the thing that makes them either capacitors or inductors, then I find that Z in here is X squared, the value of that reactance, divided by Z sub L. So this thing here works just like a quarter wavelength section of transmission line. And you can verify this yourself easily. Simply realize that this is Z sub L looking this way. This is Z sub L plus J X looking this way. There's a parallel combination here, another series addition here. And you should find that Z in equals this. One reason I mentioned this is because this lumped form of an impedance inverter does not suffer from the limitation that the terminating impedances have to be real valued. So here you could have a complex value and here you'll have the reciprocal of the complex value times x squared. This concludes this lecture on quarter wave matching.